We're entering into the second portion of the water and health course. And in this course, we also focus on wastewater and drinking water later on. But for now, we're going to focus on water pollution. Now, the term water pollution has potentially a lot of different definitions on who you may ask. Anything that might be an impurity in the water may present itself like a water pollutant to you or to others. From a regulatory standpoint, they may not call something a pollutant until it exceeds some sort of threshold. Now, you know as an environmental health scientist that if you look for something close enough in our environment with the improved analytical techniques, you're more likely to actually find it. So, is a little bit of arsenic in the water really a pollutant? Or is it really bad for a person? Now, if you look close enough into our water systems with the best techniques, you can find a whole lot of things that we might call pollutants. So just be aware of the different definitions that might be out there for whether or not society calls something a pollutant or not. Um, the regulatory framework versus what we would use in popular culture and in writing uh, can be sometimes variable. It is important for us though to be able to recognize the different kinds of pollutant sources, whether they be point sources or non-point sources. Many textbooks that have been published on the subject of the environment or even water quality, many cases refer to non-point sources as dispersed sources, meaning that there's no single point from where that particular pollutant is coming from. So you can look at a variety of these scenarios below where in all these cases we could theoretically imagine how they can act as non-point sources, but they may also have point sources involved with them too. So a construction site where the land has been cleared and they may have silt fencing around it, but if they don't and rainwater falls onto this surface and say you have a hydraulic leak from the equipment like the tractor or the soil itself, when the water hits it and runs over the soil, it may carry with it impurities, including sediment that may run off the construction site into nearby stormwater outfalls or right into nearby streams. In that case, we would look at that as being non-point source or dispersed source. A wastewater disposal system where maybe it's from a municipal plant where it's an actual pipe going into a creek, that pipe is regulated as a point source. But in the case of a failing septic system, when water falls onto the surface where the failing septic system may have sewage waste on the surface, there isn't actually a pipe or a smoking gun. The pipe might be underground, but it might be leaking out of here. Or you have a community that's got a lot of failing septic systems, they may collectively even act as non-point sources. In agriculture, particularly row crop agriculture, where they're applying fertilizer or manure, when it rains on a agricultural site, where there have been cattle or manure spread or they've spread fertilizer, that fertilizer may run off into nearby streams or run into the ground where they have this stuff called tiles. These tiles, we'll talk more about them later in this course, may speed up the transport of the water to nearby streams. But in big agricultural settings like this, where there is no clear-cut pipe, these things are acting as dispersed sources. In mining activities, sometimes you've got a combination of non-point source pollution, but many of our mines actually, although this picture suggests that it's non-point source, many of our mines are forced to actually have common outfall pipes that are regulated before the water leaves the mining site and runs into a stream. If it has a pipe that it has to flow to before leaving the mining site, then it would be point source. Home and garden. Many people like to fertilize their lawns or apply insecticides um, or pesticides. So anything that falls onto the yard and runs off, you could presume would be acting as a non-point source. And then logging. Um, by and large, logging operations, they have a lot of sediment that runs off when it rains. There are also opportunities for hydraulic leaks on the equipment. When it rains on those surfaces, there's usually no single pipe. It usually runs off the surface, down the hillsides, or down across a, a plain area into a stream. So which type are these logging examples? They would be example of non-point source. So some examples of some point source pollutants. 
and some point source point sources. Point sources in general are when you've got an actual pipe. And in this case, there's a series of these um, animal feeding operations, or this is all maybe one big animal feeding operation. And the wastewater is flowing into this thing here called a lagoon pond. And it's highly likely that after it's spent some time in this lagoon pond and maybe another lagoon pond, the microbes will break things down and there'll eventually be an outfall pipe. When you've got big livestock agriculture, in many cases before this would leave the site to go to a nearby stream, that pipe will have an actual outfall that will be regulated by an NPDES permit. In Kentucky, we call them KPDES permits. And this example here shows you kind of an area where you can imagine a lot of animals inside of it. So you'll often hear these things called CAFOs or concentrated animal feeding operations. It's where the animals can eat a lot of food really quick and then be prepared to be sold to be animals that can then go to pasture or um, go into a, uh, you know, for sale for beef. Now, these pipe outfalls are regulated and they are regulated by the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permits that are established by the Clean Water Act. In 1972, this act was passed, um, which was an improvement of the Federal Water Pollution Control Act. But the Clean Water Act, as we know it, really, really cracked down on point sources. So the previous slide, the non-point sources are the final frontier for making major improvements in our nation's water quality. So from a regulatory standpoint, which do you think would be the most challenging to deal with? Point sources or non-point sources? Well, the point sources we know are dealt with through the Clean Water Act and through the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permitting scheme. Non-point sources are not as easily regulated, so that makes them very problematic for us trying to figure out how to reduce their impact in our environment. Now, the different things that may be released from actual pipes or through surface runoff could include pathogens like fecal indicator bacteria as pathogen indicators, but viruses, different pathogens can run off. There might be certain chemicals that demand oxygen and then they would starve the fish of oxygen or other things that live in the water of oxygen. Some pollutants may be nutrients and when we think of nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are the big ones, but nitrogen and phosphorus are by far the most important nutrients for kind of putting the food into the lakes that make the algae really, really grow and cause a lot of water quality problems. But there are inorganic chemicals like metals that can go into the water. Sediment, soil, as you can imagine, it can be a problem. Radioactive substances. Heat, just raising the temperature can act as a pollutant. And then there are a variety of hydrocarbons and petrochemicals, oil, all these organic compounds can also get into the water. So where do these pollutant sources uh, exist or where do these pollutants come from? So pathogens or pathogen indicators, you know, fecal bacteria could come from wildlife. They could also come from domestic sewage, failing wastewater systems, failing septic systems, agricultural runoff, cattle wading in streams, drinking in streams, wildlife beyond just geese, but also pets, um, you know, dogs, so domestic animals as well as wildlife, um, deer. So those are just some sources. Other sources of fecal contamination could include sanitary sewer overflows and combined sewer overflows. So you should know the difference between a CSO and an SSO. So in a combined system, what makes something a combined system overflow? They're both overflows, but if you're asked, how do you differentiate between a CSO and an SSO, it's really important to know the difference. And in a CSO, by design, it was made to carry both stormwater 
and sanitary sewage. Sanitary sewage, by definition, is actually unsanitary. Sanitary sewage is like what's coming from the toilets. And sometimes it's mixed with other things. But as you can imagine, when sink water or shower water gets mixed with toilet water, it all at that point is toilet water. It is all at that point sanitary sewage. So if a water pipe or a wastewater pipe is only supposed to carry sanitary sewage and then it overflows, that is a sanitary sewer overflow. Now why would a sanitary sewer overflow? Is it like somebody gets some Snapchat challenge or something and everybody around the city of New York, we're all going to flush our toilets at once? No, that's not going to happen. Hopefully it doesn't happen. I guess it would be a bad thing if it did. But the sanitary sewers overflow because they were designed for sanitary sewage, but due to just neglect, either government neglect, a combination of homeowner neglect, tree roots and things like that have cracked these pipes over years or years the pipes just are not well maintained and when it rains really heavy it gets into those pipes not by design but just by the fact that they have not been maintained properly and that water that excess storm water getting in and it's not intentional storm water it's not by design it's the water that's broken into the tree root cracks it's the water that's broken into the the bad pipe when that water meets with the toilet water that we know of as sanitary sewage, when they come together and it overwhelms the system, there may be a manhole cover somewhere where this stuff can erupt out of it. So this is actually a picture from Lexington, but this isn't a SSO. This is actually a CSO. So what makes something a CSO? So a CSO, I'm going to show you a picture here. It's when it's combined. Okay, so we've talked about SSOs, CSOs, and we're going to come back to them in a second. These are different than something else called straight pipe pollution. And straight pipes can exist anywhere in America. Appalachian, Kentucky and Appalachian, Ohio, where I'm from, got a bad rap for these with the assumption that there were more of them there. But throughout rural America, and even in some cases urban America, these exist is where somebody has intentionally routed the, the sewage from their house to a pipe that goes to a stream, unregulated. This is a point source. It is an unregulated point source. No point source in America is allowed to be unregulated. You can't do this. This is against the law. In Kentucky, if somebody has a home that's set up like this, the health department will be the ones that will crack down on them. And if it's an elderly individual who can't afford to have a septic system installed because they live on the side of a mountain or it's a very rocky surface and it's going to be expensive, in some cases they may not allow a real estate transfer to happen and they may allow this to continue. Some people say just shut their water off, but you know, in some cases these practices have been going on for a really, really long time. And although it's problematic, unless there's resources to help the person, you're going to make a person homeless because they don't have sewage. It's a, it's a real conundrum. But there's not as many of these as there used to be, thanks to the PRIDE program. That's personal responsibility in a desirable environment. Congressman Rogers helped get that program going. So in eastern Kentucky, a lot of these have been replaced with septic systems, but there's still a lot of them that are still out there. This is a point source, it's illegal, it's called a straight pipe. There are more covert methods that exist in the suburbs where people have failing septic systems and instead of fixing them, they call Billy Bob who takes one of these and routes it to the stormwater pipe and it's hidden, but yet it is a straight pipe going into the stormwater system. Those are also big time illegal. So what makes something a CSO versus an SSO? Okay, what makes a CSO versus an SSO? I'm going to cover this a little bit more in the next video.